All praise is due to Allah the Almighty, for He has once again granted us the ability to attend the Jalsa Salana United Kingdom. In accordance with the wishes of the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him, we have gathered once more for the reformation and purifying of our souls and to increase love and brotherhood amongst one another. This was the purpose of holding the Jalsa Salana that the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him, intended in accordance to the will of Allah the Almighty. Thus keep this purpose in mind during these three days. When the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him, has instructed instructed us to not deem this an ordinary gathering, then this purpose can only be fulfilled when we attend this Jalsa with the intention of bringing about an extraordinary spiritual transformation within ourselves and strive hard in this regard. So keeping the guidance and wish of the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him, in mind, spend these three days accordingly and then institute it within your life. If we do not possess this mindset and do not make an effort for it, then our coming here is futile and worthless. The extensive arrangements made for the Jalsa, the expenditure of millions of pounds and the thousands of hours of effort by the thousands of workers will only serve as a means of worldly show and festival. Therefore, the participants of the Jalsa should strive to completely remove worldly matters from their hearts during these days and they should fulfill the purpose of attending this Jalsa Salana. I will briefly mention the objectives of the Jalsa Salana as stated by the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him. One objective is Zuhud, and then Taqwa or righteousness, and then fear of God, then kindness, then love and brotherhood, then humility, then truthfulness and trustworthiness, and then displaying enthusiasm for religious endeavors. Thus, these are those matters that everyone should keep in mind during these days. The first purpose is Zuhud. What is Zuhud? In simple words, we can say that Zuhud is virtue and piety. But the true and deep meaning of Zuhud is to sacrifice all manners of desires and emotions. We should examine ourselves to see if we are trying to achieve this condition or whether this thought even crosses our minds. Then Zuhud means renouncing one's own inner desires and wishes. It means giving up personal desires for the sake of Allah the Almighty. We must examine ourselves. Are we striving to create this state? Or do we have this desire in our hearts? 
then this also means to persistently avoid any evil thing and to reject it emphatically and firmly. Do we possess this condition within us? Or do the desires, evils and vain pursuits of the world put us from time to time towards worldly or materialistic desires? Then it means not desiring for the world. Allah the Almighty has not forbidden you from worldly earnings, but has forbidden preferring the world over religion. We say in every ple pledge that we will give precedence to our faith over worldly matters. And the women also take this pledge. But how many of them adhere to this pledge and always keep it in their hearts? It also means to avoid certain things for the sake of Allah the Almighty's pleasure. And it also means to leave matters to Allah the Almighty making Allah the Almighty's pleasure the ultimate objective and completely avoiding selfish desires. Now examine how in this one word, the promised Messiah peace be upon him has explained all aspects of reformation for us. If we understand this depths of this one word and act upon it, our worldly life as well as our religious and afterlife would be adorned and reformed. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, explained this by saying that there is no plate for monasticism in Islam. He said that making a permissible thing forbidden upon oneself and wasting one's wealth has nothing to do with the zuhud. If someone leaves all worldly entanglements and goes to the forest, avoiding the rights owed to familial ties, this is also contrary to zuhud. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said that living in this world while sacrificing your inner passions for the sake of God the Almighty is true zuhud. If you must abandon your rights, then it should be abandoned for God Almighty's pleasure. This is true devotion. Devotion means not to let worldly desires become a hindrance in seeking Allah the Almighty's pleasure. Spending wealth for the propagation of religion and for fulfilling the rights of people is zuhud. So you have not been forbidden from earning wealth, but it is a condition for a believer to consider everyone's rights regarding it and to fulfill it. By the grace of Allah the Almighty, we still see this standard of selfless spending in many Ahmadis today. So this is the zuhud that the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, wished to instill in us, in accordance to the instructions of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And the promised Messiah has included it in the objectives of the Jalsa. If this one aspect truly develops within us, we can create a revolution within our lives and in our environment as well. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, says in one place, Religion and the world cannot be combined in one place, except in the case when God wills. He makes a person's nature so blessed that despite being involved in worldly affairs, he holds his faith of higher importance. Such people also exist in the world. Only if Allah the Almighty wills can a person hold his faith superior to the worldly matters, and for this it is necessary to bow down and prostrate before Allah the Almighty. He says, Thus a person is mentioned in Tadkaratar al who was involved in transactions worth thousands of rupees. A saint saw him, and in a vision, he found that his heart, despite being involved in such huge transactions, that is, the one who was a business person, was not heedless of God the Almighty for even a moment. It is regarding such people that Allah says, Men whom neither commerce nor sale distracts from the remembrance of Allah. And this is the excellence of a person, that he remains engaged in worldly business, but does not forget God. This is the excellence of a person that he remains engaged in worldly business but does not forget God. What good is a mule that when burdened with good sits down and when he is unburdened works well? He is not praiseworthy. That poor person who gets frustrated with worldly affairs and becomes a recluse in reality shows weakness. There is no monasticism in Islam. We never say that one should abandon his wives and children and leave worldly business. No, rather, 
An employee should fulfill his duties, and a trader should carry out his business transactions, but give the faith precedence. So if we become those who prefer faith while living in the world, only then will we fulfill the wishes and the expectations of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. Therefore, as I have said, the gist and a summary in a nutshell is that in order to achieve zuhud, it is necessary to fulfill the rights of worship of Allah the Almighty. It is necessary to rid ourselves of vain things. Abstaining from bad morals and displaying high morals is devotion. Removing grievances and laying the foundation of reconciliation is devotion. Promoting love and brotherhood for the sake of Allah the Almighty's pleasure is devotion. This is a brief description of zuhud. If we go into further detail, more paths of virtue will continue to open. Out of the many objectives, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, mentioned this as a great objective of the Jalsa. As I have said, if we infuse these aspects within our lives, we will be able to bring about a spiritual revolution within ourselves. The rest of the aspects he mentioned are further details of Zuhud. He said one objective of the Jalsa is to develop piety or taqwa. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, one recited a poetic verse that said, Every virtue is rooted in piety. This poetic verse was also read in a poem just now. Upon this he received a revelation when Allah the Almighty reveals, if this root remains intact, everything else remains. Allah the Almighty has repeatedly drawn attention to taqwa in the Holy Quran. And the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, who came to establish the authority of the Holy Quran in this world, was told by Allah the Almighty to explain to his followers that if they hold on to the root of all virtue, which is taqwa, then they will find God and will also attain this world. If they only run after the world, then they might gain the temporary benefits of the world, but they will have no preparation for attempting to please Allah the Almighty. This is something we should always remember. Similarly, merely professing our belief in Allah the Almighty that we offer prayers is insufficient if the condition of righteousness is not fulfilled, and if the requisites of fearing and loving God are not met. Only when these are achieved, Will the prayers become true and genuine prayers? The fervour with which we pray for our worldly needs and personal necessity is not matched by the fervour with which we pray for the growth of our faith and religion, to develop our inner spirituality and to advance in righteousness. Therefore, such prayers and supplications are not valued by Allah the Almighty. Therefore, we need to evaluate ourselves in this regard. If we conduct this self-evaluation, we will be able to achieve our objectives and safeguard ourselves collectively from the harm that opponents often spread against us. Opponents may also perform prayers and in Pakistan, they claim that the right to pray is exclusively theirs and that Ahmadis cannot pray. However, their intentions are malicious and they are devoid of righteousness. Therefore, the acts of worship are not accepted by Allah the Almighty as they are oppressors, promoters of injustice, and advocates of violence who issue religious edicts to kill those who profess the Kalama, Islamic creed, and enact these fatwas edicts as well. So such people, according to the teachings of Allah the Almighty and His Messenger وسلم, are damaging the afterlife rather than attaining the pleasure of Allah the Almighty. When we observe such examples, we should be even more grateful to Allah the Almighty and strive to progress in righteousness and strengthening our faith. Only then will our prayers be accepted and only then will we be able to improve our lives both in this world and in the hereafter. May Allah the Almighty enable us to always seek true virtue and endeavor to practice it. R righteousness or taqwa is characteristic of a true believer attained through sincere bowing and prostrating before Allah the Almighty alone. This virtue and righteousness is marked by sincerity, fervor, devotion and unrelenting bows and prostrations. This righteousness causes tongues to constantly remain filled with the remembrance of Allah the Almighty through the morning and into the evening. 
This righteousness involves achieving high standards of worship free from any impurities of the self and truly fulfilling the rights of humanity with genuine seal, sympathy and love. Whilst treading upon the path of taqwa or righteousness, you should excel in your love for the poor, orphans and needy. And in order to attain all of this, Allah the Almighty instructs us to progress in our faith in Him. We will attain these virtues if we grow in our belief of Allah the Almighty. As our faith in Allah the Almighty strives for perfection, we will be inclined to avoid evil and pursue goodness. Understanding this requires belief in the Day of Judgment, which will motivate us to shun evil because it reminds us of the consequences of the hereafter and the life to come. To understand and comprehend these matters, it is essential to study the Holy Qur'an with maintained focus and concentration, as only then will we learn of the commandments of Allah the Almighty, acting upon them and will allow us to increase in righteousness. These are the very virtues that the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, wished to instill within us. Otherwise, it is not enough to simply pledge allegiance to the Bayat and verbally profess that all praise belongs to Allah, we are Ahmadi Muslims. And according to the prophecies of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, we have accepted the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi. That is not enough. Therefore, during the days of Jalsa, every one of you should continue to evaluate yourselves as to what degree you are abiding by the teachings of Allah the Almighty and the Holy Prophet wasallam. What is this Jalsa teaching us? What revolutionary transformation are we bringing about in ourselves? Have our standards of worship improved? Are we able to focus solely on Allah the Almighty during our prayers? Is our standard of fulfilling the rights of Allah the Almighty higher than before? Has our standard of fulfilling the rights of humanity risen higher? Are we more inclined towards fulfilling our pledge than before? Allah the Almighty states that you will be held accountable for the pledges that you have made. Thus, as I have mentioned, we pledge to give precedence to our faith over worldly matters. We must evaluate ourselves whether we will be able to give a positive answer to Allah the Almighty and say, Yes, we try to our best to fulfill it when he, we, he holds us accountable for our pledges or will we look for some excuse or the other. Furthermore, it is incumbent for a mu'min, a believer, to fulfill the vows made with one another. These commandments have already been given to us by Allah the Almighty and the Holy Qur'an. Only when we study the Holy Qur'an with the intention to act on its teaching will we become true believers and be counted amongst the righteous. Moreover, righteousness requires one to adhere to the laws of the land unless they contradict the commandments of Allah the Almighty. As is in the case in Pakistan, where Ahmadis are prohibited from performing prayers and reciting the Qur'an. Governments have no right to interfere in matters of religion and faith. Apart from this, following the law and pledging loyalty to the country is obligatory for every Ahmadi. Anyhow, everything that directs attention towards fulfilling the rights of Allah, the Almighty and His creation springs forth from taqwa or righteousness and demonstrating taqwa is the duty of every Ahmadi Muslim. Furthermore, as the promised Messiah peace be upon him has emphasized another objective of Jalsa, the need to develop tender-heartedness and kindness. We must focus on this. If we come here and fail to reform ourselves in this connection, our attendance is pointless. Allah the Almighty has promised paradise to those described as that those who suppress anger and pardon and forgive others. Suppressing anger and forgiving others are great qualities. Those whose hearts are filled with resentment due to others' actions should reflect. After coming into this environment and atmosphere, on Allah the Almighty's command and in line with the promised Messiah peace be upon him's desire, Cultivate heartfelt softness and humility in your hearts. Lay the foundation of reconciliation and create an environment that exemplifies a true Islamic society, both here and wherever they go afterwards and wherever they may reside or live. This will lead them to attain the pleasure of Allah the Almighty. 
The quality of forgiveness is so dear and beloved to Allah the Almighty that He states He loves those who forgive. So who would not desire Allah the Almighty's love? Thus those who harbour any form of resentment should use these days to truly forgive one another and completely eliminate all ill feelings, grudges and spite in a heartfelt fashion. Only then can we establish a beautiful Islamic society. Otherwise, one cannot fulfill the objective of pledging allegiance or bet to the promised Messiah. Not only are we commanded to remove grudges, but we are also instructed to take a step further and treat others with kindness. This kind treatment will instill genuine remorse and thoughts of true forgiveness in others. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, prescribed giving gifts to foster love. Therefore, this practice should be adopted as well. Non-Ahmadis are often impressed by us, are frequently commenting on the brotherhood and discipline within the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat or the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Every Ahmadi should strive to embody this in their true lives. This should not be a mere display for pretentiousness or showing off to others, but this should genuinely be a part and parcel of our lives. When we suppress our anger and refrain from retaliation for the sake of Allah the Almighty, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said that there is a greater reward for this than for anything else. This is the standard we must strive for, to eliminate personal grievances for the sake of Allah the Almighty and thus gain the reward that is accepted by Him and makes us deserving of His grace. Blessed are those who act upon this, for they will inherit Allah's grace. Otherwise, the hardness of the heart gradually eradicates all tenderness, preventing us from achieving the example that the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, instructed us to achieve. And so the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, states that it is only when one strives to improve this state of morality during the Jalsa will they achieve its true purpose. Then another purpose for attending the Jalsa outlined by the promised Messiah is to establish mutual love and ties of brotherhood. Whilst mentioning this as a quality of believers, Allah the Almighty states that they are tender amongst themselves. When everyone exhibits and demonstrates this, then the natural outcome will be an increase. Even if they are not entirely eliminated, they will hardly exist. This is a type of society which the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, came to establish in light of Islam's teachings. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, stated, On the Day of Judgment, Allah the Almighty will ask, Where are the people who loved each other for the sake of my greatness and glory? Then Allah the Almighty will say, On this day, when there is no shade except for mine, I will grant them a place under my shade of mercy. How fortunate are those who act according to this guidance, and therefore receive the mercy of Allah the Almighty and come under His shade. Then another thing which the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, has drawn attention towards is the moral quality of humility and humbleness. This quality is exhibited when one interacts with others. In theory, there are many people who meet one another and they display humility. However, when there is something which is contrary to their own personal benefits, humility is left behind, while haughtiness and arrogance comes to the forefront. A distinguishing quality which Allah the Almighty described of the servants of the gracious God is that they are humble, as He says. And the servants of the gracious God are those who walk on the earth in a dignified manner, and when the ignorant address them, they say, Peace. And so the believer should show humility under all circumstances. If there is any instance where sentiments could be provoked, or instances where people may compete with one another by expressing their own pride, those who are humble convey the greeting of peace and leave from such places. Allah the Almighty has regarded those who are arrogant as ignorant. 
once the promised Messiah refused a challenge for the sake of Allah the Almighty. Upon this, Allah the Almighty said to him, He is pleased with your ways of humility and your humble ways. This is the standard with which we should try to establish within ourselves as well, and we should strive to truly become servants of the gracious God. By establishing a virtuous example within society, we should try to bring about reform. Our effort should be to bring about this reform with wisdom and tenderness. Expressions of arrogance and haughtiness contribute to escalating disputes. So by becoming servants of the gracious God, while bearing in mind Allah the Almighty's attribute of graciousness, you should strive to make your actions such that attracts Allah the Almighty's graciousness. This is the foundation of peace and security in society. Any sort of peace within society is destroyed by arrogance and a false sense of ego and pride. Today, the world is in turmoil and strife. Countries are attacking one another, and it is all rooted in their attempts of displaying their might and superiority. The development of arrogance leads these people to usurping the rights of others. This is exactly the case these days when it comes to the major powers, and this is exactly what is leading the world towards a global war. Hence, while you work during these days to establish these qualities of humility and abstaining from arrogance, you should also pray for the world. May Allah the Almighty grant sense to the world, so that they do not destroy the world for the sake of their pride. As humans, we have no value, yet with the slightest bit of power, people think the world of themselves, and that nothing else compares to them. At one instance, whilst advising us to remain humble, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, states, In your mind, consider yourself worse than all else. Perhaps you may enter the house of union in this way. Therefore, if we wish to attain the nearness of Allah the Almighty, we must adopt humility. Arrogance is an occupation of the worldly, whereas we have pledged allegiance to the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, in order to gain nearness to Allah. Therefore, we must always bear this important aspect in mind. Then the promised Messiah has drawn attention towards the teaching of truthfulness and being straightforward. This should be the hallmark of a mu'min, a true believer, and an Ahmadi Muslim. This is something which Allah the Almighty has emphasized especially. The promised Messiah, peace be upon him, states, The Holy Quran has laid such emphasis on establishing truthfulness that I do not at all believe that the Gospels have laid even a fraction of the same emphasis in this regard. Thus a believer, a mu'min, is occupied with being truthful, whilst worldly people try to benefit from falsehood and deceit. We should analyze ourselves to see whether we are establishing the highest degrees of truthfulness in order to attain the pleasure of Allah the Almighty. If we attain this standard, then the disputes in our homes will end. The disputes and issues in society will also end. Problems in relationships also arise due to a lack of truthfulness. Therefore, everyone should pay special attention to this. Then the promised Messiah states, Give precedence to the faith over the world and display a passion and zeal for your religious endeavors. If one establishes the previously mentioned characteristics, the faith will automatically be given precedence over the world. It is only when this happens that when we become those who fulfill the mission of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. It is only then that we can become those who bring the world under the banner and the flag of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. It is only then that we can establish the sovereignty of God Almighty in the world. Otherwise, discrepancies between our words and actions will deprive us of Allah the Almighty's blessings. We will be counted amongst those who have claimed to pledge allegiance verbally, whilst our actions will be proved contrary. Therefore, if we wish to do justice to our oath of allegiance, we must bring about practical changes within ourselves. In order to help people recognize God Almighty and bring them closer to Him, to bring them under the flag of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon Him, and to make the world aware of Islam's true teachings, every Ahmadi will have to use all of their capabilities and bring about a significant change within themselves. While bringing about a change, they will have to strive with a new determination to try and spread the beautiful teachings of Islam to the world. Along with giving more attention towards praying for themselves, they will also have to pray for the reformation of the world. When the prayers of our men, women, 
elderly and children will reach the heavens with distinct pain. Then we will become those who bring about a revolutionary change in the world. It is then that we will become those who are safe against the opposition and despicable attacks of the enemy. We will witness victories and triumph. This is a grand undertaking for which we have been commanded and for which we have the expectations of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him. If we ourselves are distant from piety and righteousness and zuhud, if we have not inculcated the highest standards of morals within ourselves, if we do not possess that pain which will enable us to go forth in the field of propagating the religion of the bleak and exert all our capabilities and faculties, then we are not fulfilling our pledge of allegiance, our bayat, nor are we doing justice to it. Hence, during this jalsa, we should strive to bring about those virtuous changes within ourselves, which will enable us to achieve those same objectives for which the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, was commissioned. Otherwise, as the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, states, this jalsa becomes a means of sin, misguidance, and an evil innovation. The promised Messiah, peace be upon them, has given this warning in very strong terms. Therefore, there is a serious need to improve our practical conditions with a great deal of prayers and effort. Otherwise, the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, says, this jalsa is of no benefit and instead becomes a means of misguidance. How strong these words are! He also says that this jalsa becomes an evil innovation. Aren't there already enough harmful innovations which have taken root in the world, let alone the need for another in the form of a gathering? Therefore, every Ahmadi should strive to make this jalsa a source of blessings rather than a source of misguidance, of spreading a harmful innovation, nor of incurring the displeasure of Allah the Almighty. We should make this a means of bringing about a revolution in the world rather than making it a means for the displeasure of Allah the Almighty. We should pledge and pray in these days that we will not rest until the sovereignty of Allah the Almighty is established in the world, until we bring an end to Satan and his ploys, and until we save the world from misguidance. This is a grand task, but if we have pure intentions, we have molded our conditions in accordance with the pleasure of God Almighty, and we are praying to Allah the Almighty, then Allah the Almighty will surely bless our work. Therefore, Ahmadis in every corner of the world should pledge to do whatever they can according to the means available to them in order to achieve this and to that end. They will fervently pray to Allah the Almighty. During these days, recite durood, invoking salutations and blessings upon the Holy Prophet a great deal. May Allah the Almighty enable us to achieve the virtuous objectives for which the Jalsa is held. May we truly become those who bring about a true pious change within ourselves and become examples for the world. During these days, also remember the oppressed Palestinians in your prayers. May Allah the Almighty swiftly create ease for them. Also remember the oppressed Ahmadis in Pakistan in your prayers who have been deprived of holding Jalsa. May Allah the Almighty swiftly procure the means for their freedom and ease. Now please join me in silent prayer.
آمین